Shalom, brothers and sisters. I want to share a passage with you from First Moses, from the Torah of Moses, from the Plates of Brass. Earlier this week, a friend of mine and I were discussing the story of Nimrod. And in the Torah of Moses, the story is a little bit longer than what we see in Genesis. And it starts off with Emerkar, who becomes Nimrod later in the story, as a righteous king. He wants to be worthy of the Lord. And so he stri he strives very hard to try to get his people to be good and to be a righteous people and to basically build Zion. They believe that it is the that they're living in the end times and it's the end of the world for whatever reason. <clears throat> and so they're trying to basically set up preparations for this event. Well, in the story, the people get very wicked, very violently wicked. In fact, in the, the chapter before this one, this judge kills a bunch of refugees to try to hide the fact that he's doing things unrighteously. It, it's, it's, it gets pretty dark. And in this chapter, chapter 19, which is called the 12 Righteous, so you have these people, they're building this tower, but they see it as a temple and they want to know, what do we do in the temple? And so this judge has these 12 men rounded up and this judge's name is Laden, L-A-A-D-E-N. And Laden tells them, you know, give me the secrets of the temple or I'm going to kill you. And of course, they refuse. So they end up thrown in prison. And in prison, they say this prayer. They're in prison with a bunch of, of foreign refugees who, you know, they went there thinking that they were coming to this Zionistic, happy, loving place and... Once they got there, they realized nobody wants them. So they've been imprisoned. And gathering in a circle, they say this prayer where they basically say, whatever your will is, Lord, even if it means we die, whatever your will is, we, we want your will to, to come to pass. And so these refugees are shocked. Like, who are these 12 guys? They're thrown in here. They're citizens. Doesn't seem like there's anything wrong. And now they're saying, hey, Lord, we, we're willing to die. Whatever it is you need from us. Well, when the time is up, Laden sends for the 12, and the 12 have already decided, okay, we're going to speak as one. This man, um, Zohar, T-Z-O-P-H-A-R, is going to be the man to speak for them, and he is going to give to Laden what their teachings are as far as the secrets of the temple. He says... Um, it came to pass that Zohar stood again before the judge at this time saying, we shall give thee our counsel. And thus was Laden much pleased. And he sat greedily upon his throne, awaiting the words of the 12 righteous. But the words that he were, was given were not what you would expect. You know, I grew up a, uh, a Brighamite, I went through their temple service and, you know, their temple secrets were handshakes and various uh, mudras and mantras to use in meditation. And, you know, you, you watch a video and it, it, this is not, this is not what Laden was given. What Laden was given was the following. Exercise brotherly and sisterly love for all of mankind is one family. Give to those that need without judgment, nor in debt, nor for reward. Truth is the name of Yiva, for he is truth. Therefore, be true in all things. Go forth not rashly, neither flee in cowardice, but stand firm in the Lord. Let reason be your guide in the Lord, listening always for the Holy Spirit, the breath of Elohim. Give, give not to your passions, but reign them, as a, and guide them that thou be true to your heart and not a whim of the flesh. Do that which is right before the Lord at all things and give unto others their due. All things you have been given are of the Lord Elohim and to him all things are due. Know these things, forget them not, but write them upon your hearts and the words written upon your tongues will be pure and holy before the Lord. 
Now, if if I were to tell you I'm going to give you the secrets of the Brighamite Temple and I read you a list like that, you would be like, uh, I don't think this is correct. Um, I heard there was something about the Garden of Eden and, uh, you know, Satan shows up and there's like signs and tokens. I, there's none of this here. But then it hit me. No, these are the secrets of the temple. This is the answer to the question. If Emerkar or Nimrod was trying to build Zion... This is the secret. This is the key. This is how you build Zion. So I want to go over these with you, and I may make a series of videos on each of these individually another time. But for right now, I just want to briefly look at each of these and how they connect and how we can use these to be Zion so that Zion can be built. So the first one is to exercise brotherly and sisterly love for all mankind is one family. Now I want to stop here for a second and I want to mention that if you're reading along in an actual copy of the Torah of Moses, this isn't going to be word for word the same. Um, I am using more modern language here because, you know, the people listening to this video do not have the footnotes. It actually says for all Adam is one family and Adam in Hebrew means mankind. But in translating this book, I felt very impressed that Adam should be here because we are, in a sense, all one purpose. At least that's my understanding of why the Lord wanted me to use the name and not that word. And I, I think that's important. And I can't help but wonder, is this what King Benjamin read? Is this why he talked about serving others so much in his address in the Book of Mormon at the beginning of the Book of Messiah? Because this talks about this idea that we're all one. And then it extends to the second one saying that we need to give without judgment, without putting people in debt or without you know, doing it for a reward. Uh, you know, judging someone else. I mean, this is very reminiscent in my mind of King Benjamin's address. By saying someone else isn't worthy, we are confessing of our own unworthiness. Who are you to condemn someone else when you just received the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what King Benjamin said. So we, we don't have any right to judge others because we are imperfect ourselves. We are expecting Jesus to save us. And so therefore we can't judge others asking us for help, right? And so you know, those two are verse 41 in chapter 19. And even though they're two, I can see why they are together. They, they flow so nicely into one another. And then verse 42 is the same. It just flows right from there into truth being the name of the Lord. The Lord's name is truth. Therefore, we should be true in all things. How can we do what we've been asked to do in verse 41 if it's not who we are inside of ourselves? If we're just faking it. I mean, you know, you can't fake it till you make it. I've, I've heard this idea that if you pretend to be a good person long enough, eventually you become a good person. But the opposite is also true. If you pretend long enough, eventually you say, I'm tired of pretending and you just want to be your true self. So I say, be your true self. And if you want to be a certain way, then be that way because it's who you are and become that person. There may be some truth to fake it till you make it, but at the end of the day, as we build our personal relationship with God, God will transform us into our best selves far faster and far better than we can try to do on our own. That's the importance of the grace in the atonement of Jesus Christ. Then the second half of verse 42 says, go forth not rashly. You know, don't go forth rashly. Also, don't flee in cowardice, but stand firm in the Lord. Now, it's interesting to me that this verse says his name is truth, and then it ends saying, to stand firm in the Lord, because basically that's saying, stand firm in truth. And it, it makes sense. If you have a personal relationship with the Lord and you're doing these things by following the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about in the next verse in just a second, then we're not rushing forward or, or falling back. We are standing still and moving forward or backwards in God. Again, it's who we are, and it's that personal relationship that we're building. And again, this leads right into 43. Let reason be thy guide in Yavah, listening always for the breath of Elohim. 
Let reason be your guide in the Lord, listening always for the Holy Ghost. That's basically what it says. Well, that's actually translating into modern English exactly what it says. So if we're standing in truth and we're moving when we need to move, we need to use our rational thoughts. We need to think for ourselves. At the same time, we need to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And we can only do that by building a personal relationship with God so that we know when it's the Holy Spirit speaking. One question I get asked a lot is, how do I know it's God? How do I know it's not just a bologna sandwich or something that, that feels good because it sounds good? And that's a great question. And my answer is, you've got to build that relationship with the Lord so you can tell when it's you and when it's not. There is no easy answer for that. I can tell when the Lord's speaking to me and I can tell when I wish it was the Lord. I just want it to be the Lord and when it's, when it's not the Lord because it feels different. It sounds different. I feel different. I've talked about this in, in other videos. So if we're standing in truth and we're standing in love and now we're moving based on our own rational thoughts combined with the voice of the Holy Spirit, then the second half of verse 43, we will give not to our passions, but reign them and guide them that we can be true to our hearts and not a whim of the flesh. So this gets back to it being who we truly are. It's not like you, you're, you're pretending to be something to get something. You know, that, that's usually what seems to happen. I remember as a child, there were times when I pretended to be really, really good. I didn't do the bad thing because I wanted the candy or I wanted to go to the park or whatever the reward was, right? Well, that's nice. But at the end of the day, was I really good? I behaved. But in my heart, I was selfish. To be Zion, we have to do more than just behave. We have to be the people of God from the inside out. Now, this leads to verse 44. Because you're doing all these other things, now we can do that which is right before the Lord at all times. Give others their due. All things that we have been given are of the Lord God. And to him are all things due. We can't take credit for our own righteousness. We can't say, look at how awesome I am. We talk about how blessed we are and how our relationship in the Lord has moved us forward and made us the people that we are. And by the people we are, I don't mean our material wealth. I don't mean the friends that we have or the people that surround us. I mean who we are on the inside. God can change and will change and does change the things around us. But what's really, truly important to the Lord is the change that's going on inside of us. That's where the grace of Jesus Christ and the atonement of Jesus Christ truly take place. Know these things, forget them not, but write them upon your hearts. And the words written upon your tongue shall be pure and holy before the Lord. Now this is very, very important. The things that come out of us come out of us because of what's written in here. I mean, all this is just saying the same thing over and over again. It's like it's like a loop, a, a chain, a cycle. Each one is, is connected. Now, I want to ask you a question. In verse 46, it says, It came to pass that when Laden heard these words, he did grow angry at the twelve righteous men, for he understood not the words of the Lord. I want to ask you, how do you feel having heard this scripture passage, having heard my ideas on it, does it make you feel angry, like laden? Or are you feeling the Holy Spirit testifying to you that these words are true? Because if the Lord is testifying to you that these words are true, then I want to encourage you to follow them. Now, there's one last thing I want to talk about before I go. And... This kind of goes right back up. You know, we're going to start it. We're going to end at the beginning. We started talking about this idea of um, exercising brotherly and sisterly love. Now, 
I believe that without starting there, we can't continue down this list. If we can't do that one, the rest of it aren't, aren't, they're just not going to happen. And so therefore, we may have a little bit of the first one, which allows us to have a little bit of the second one and so on and so forth. But as we get more of the first one, we'll get more of the second one and so on and so forth. And when I was looking at this this morning, I was impressed, the Lord impressed upon my mind a note that's in the book of the law of the Lord. Now, I'm going to be reading from um, this edition. This is the uh, Millennium Edition. Um, it was printed in Louisiana, so I think this is Samuel West's version. I'm not using the Fellowship version because we don't have uh, James Strang's notes at this point in there. But in, uh, this is on page 46, it's in the, uh, let's see, chapter 14, the Eucharist. And right after verse 3, where it is just talking about the, the sacrament table, it says, It is not right to stay away from the table of the Lord because anyone there has wronged us. The table is the Lord's, not ours. We partake seeing his body and blood in the bread and wine. And if we stay away, stay in contempt of him. Now, when I first read this, I was reminded very strongly of the first time I went to the Brighamite Temple. In the Brighamite Temple at the end, you gather in a prayer circle and they invite everybody up and they say, if you have any, if you harbor any ill will towards anyone in the circle, please don't come up. Just go sit back down. Um, because only the, the purest thoughts can be in here. And I'm paraphrasing. That's not exactly what they say, but it's something to that effect. And that really struck me and it really stuck with me. And when I got up to the circle, I looked at every single person there. And every time afterwards I would go to their temple, I would I would look at everybody there and say, how do I feel about these people? And when I read this note in this book, I was like, wow, this is literally the exact opposite. Instead of saying, stay away, it's saying you'll be condemned for not coming up. I don't think that they're both wrong. I think that if we harbor ill will in the Brighamite prayer circle, we're not worthy of being there. And the reason why is because exactly what James Strang says here. Because we are in contempt of the Lord. So I, I want to read this from a, from a completely different perspective now. It is not right to stay away from the prayer circle because anyone there has wronged us. The circle is the Lord's, not ours. We are to partake, and if we stay away, we stay in contempt of Him. I think that that is true. And I think that the Brighamites could, could take this verbiage and add it to their temple ceremony and not be wrong. Because... We're in the Lord's house, but we're not Zion in our hearts. And I think that this is important to understand because from my perspective, I believe, and this is a Kabbalistic idea, that the world is a mirror. When we see evil in others, what we're really seeing is evil in ourselves. Now, that's not to say that we've done the bad thing that they've done, but it reminds us that we aren't perfect ourselves. We are flawed. And when we can forgive ourselves, it becomes easier to forgive others. So, I want to now read this a third way. It is not right to stay away from Zion, because anyone there has wronged us. Zion is the Lord's, not ours. We partake, and if, or we join in, we join in Zion, and if we stay away, we stay in contempt of him. Think about that. How do we move away from that contempt? Now, whether the prophet is correct here, I don't know. I think, I think the verbiage is a bit harsh. But I think the idea 
is somewhat sound. I, I believe that grace protects us, but I believe it through Jesus Christ, it's something that we need to overcome. And to overcome that, we have to exercise brotherly and sisterly love for all of Adam is one family. We need to give forgiveness, give love, give charity to those that need without judgment, nor in debt, nor for reward. So if you walk away from, to, from this message today and you can only take one thing with you, please take that with you. Please take verse 41 with you. Because so many people want to talk to me about building Zion. And until we have that brotherly sister love so that Zion is built here, it will be impossible to build it anywhere else. So that's my Sabbath message, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.